We're so glad that you're joining us today. I do not believe that you're here by accident, but I believe that God has a word that he wants to speak to you today. We're going to be looking in Philippians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, pull it out. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead, wherever you are, download the YouVersion app and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. I believe that God's going to speak to you today. And if you would allow just to open up your hearts, I believe that he's going to change your life. And we're going to be talking about a topic today that I believe is very timely. And the topic is press on. Press on. And, and what, what I mean is, what I want us to see in our time together is that guilt will cripple every area of your life, but grace will set you free. So press on. Whatever you feel like is holding you back in this season. Whatever lie the enemy has been speaking over your life, I want to encourage you today, press on. I don't want you to be held back today from your past. Maybe it's the guilt or shame of something that you've done. It could even be guilt and shame over something maybe good that you have done. No, no, no. I want you to press on with heaven's agenda. I believe that I have the most wonderful wife on the planet. Uh, she is beautiful, she is talented, and she's super supportive of everything that I do. And my wife and I, we grew up in Christian homes and very similar church environments. And I, I don't want to say anything negative about our church environments. It is what made us who we are today. And we have many wonderful stories and experiences uh, from the way that we grew up in church. But one of the experiences was that there was almost this, it was, it was this unsaid kind of facade that you had to put on that if you were going through a challenging time that you had to put on an appearance that everything was okay. Have you ever grown up in an atmosphere like that or been involved in a church where every time you walk through the doors, everybody's like, how are you doing? Too good, brother. God's too good. Don't deserve all the blessings on my life. Meanwhile, you, you might know that their, their life could be falling apart and that, you know, it's okay. A lesson that we never really quite learned was that it's okay to not be okay. And we really didn't understand how this upbringing negatively affected our lives until several years into our marriage. We stepped into the journey of foster care. And we said yes to bringing a little 16-month-old boy into our home. And immediately, we fell headfirst in love with this boy. And he was a part of our family. And then nine months later, we had to have a really ch tough decision, and the right decision, but we had to reunite him with his mother. And, and I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember loading him in the car, and, and I remember pulling away, and I remember waving goodbye, and I remember... Just the weight of that moment, thinking to myself, here, I've, I've fallen in love with this little boy. I've cared for him for nine months, and I couldn't possibly love a, a human more than I love him. And now I just don't know if I'm going to see him again. Maybe not. And so I didn't know where to put that. My wife and I, neither one of us knew where to put that. And that, I mean, we went right into the house, and we, we bawled our eyes out, and we cried every night for months. So, uh, where do you put that level of raw emotion and the, the, the guilt we felt or the grief that we experienced. And I think because of our upbringing, we quickly moved towards, when people would say, how are you doing? We quickly moved towards the typical answer of, well, you know, taking it one day at a time. God's in control. Or how are you doing? Oh, everything is okay. We're believing that God has a bigger plan, bigger purpose, and we're just trusting him. But in reality, we would go home and we cry our eyes out in doubt and in guilt and shame had we tried everything that we could have and did we make the most of every moment and why do we feel all this guilt and shame over not being okay have you ever felt that before where you just felt an overwhelming amount of guilt and shame like you're not measuring up to somebody's standard over your life and instead of living in grace you live in guilt fast forward about a year and my wife began to experience some significant health issues. Um, I remember we were on a trip, and she had started to have trouble breathing. So much trouble breathing that she was getting faint. And I remember uh, holding her and falling down together and catching her breath and thinking to myself, like, 
this doesn't look good. Her heart was skipping beats, and she was lightheaded and couldn't catch her breath. And so immediately we rushed her to the ER and uh, ran some tests, and eventually she came out of it and was better. And that was the beginning of a really difficult and a really challenging season of life where we did everything from countless ER visits. She wore a heart monitor. Uh, We saw therapists and countless specialist doctors to try to determine what is going on. I've sat holding my wife with her not being able to breathe night after night after night. And what we began to realize was that there was a lot of undealt with trauma that we put on a facade that we said everything was okay instead of just dealing with the raw emotions. You see, guilt and grief left alone is like shrapnel to the brain and eventually it will tear you apart from the inside out. And maybe you're here today and maybe you've experienced something similar where uh, you feel like maybe physically your body is shutting down or emotionally or mentally you become unhealthy and, and just maybe, just maybe there's some some, some guilt, just maybe there's some, some shame or something from your past that you've been holding on to instead of just opening up your hands and saying, God, I, I want to come to you just the way that I am. I don't want to carry this anymore. Instead of carrying that, I want to carry your grace on my life and I want to live in freedom. And as my wife began to pursue this journey of living out God's grace on her life, her body began to be healed. So much so that... Uh, she became fully healed and she got a tattoo on her arm that said, grace carried me here and by God's grace, I'll carry on. Another way that you could say that is, by God's grace, I will press on. As we see in the text. Let's look at this first few verses in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 13. It says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. When Paul says, one thing I do, I'm listening, okay? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. This passage is preceding Paul talking in great detail about his longing and his desire to know Christ. In Philippians 2.10, he says, to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. And then here in verses 12 and 13, he goes on to say, not that I have arrived, not that I have perfected this. How many of you would say that's true over your life? In your knowing Christ, in your pursuit of Christ, how many of you would say, I haven't fully attained it, I haven't perfected it, I'm in pursuit. This is my pursuit of understanding God's grace my pursuit of my knowledge of who Christ is, my pursuit of recognizing his redemption, forgiveness over my life. And so the heading for these first 12 verses is that your past is forgiven, that we're in pursuit over perfection. It's our deepest desire to know him and to press on in him. And then he says, but one thing I do, forgetting the past, one thing I do, forgetting the past, And I wrote down, we cannot live out God's purpose today if we're consumed by our guilt from the past. And I believe that guilt can take on many different forms. It can take on forms in both your sins and your successes. What do I mean by that? Guilt over sin says, Christ could never use me because I've dot, 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 you fill in the blank. Christ could never use me because I've been selfish, because I've wasted my life. Christ could never use me because I've made too many mistakes. Christ could never use me because I've hurt too many people. Christ could never use me because I've neglected my faith. Christ could never use me because I'm beat up and banged up. That is guilt over sin and this this weight of sin on our life. But grace says you're a new creation in Christ. The old thing is gone. Behold, all things are made new, nothing is impossible with God. Guilt over our successes may say that I've worked so hard, yet I've never truly been good enough. I've made so much money, yet I've neglected the poor and the marginalized. But grace says, come to me just the way that you are. 
I am all that I need to sustain you. You are not meant to carry the weight of guilt and shame in your life. Paul is talking about this idea of running and pressing on in a pursuit, like a race. Can you imagine running a race with just thousands of pounds on your back? That's like running a race with guilt on your back, looking back constantly at your past, looking back constantly at the negative things in your past and saying, like, God could never use me. But you're meant to carry the weight of grace. Because what happens is guilt holds you back. Grace presses you forward. It's not about us having laid hold of Christ, but Christ having laid hold of us. Isn't it interesting that he says that? He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Do you notice the nuances there in the text? That I may lay hold, but then look, Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. You see the difference there? That we're in pursuit of the knowledge the apprehension, the understanding. But Christ has already made it understood on our lives. We see this through in 1 John 4, 9 through 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Listen to this. In this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Aren't you grateful today? That your freedom, your grace, the, run that, the race that God has called you to, not, to run is not hinging on your ability to apprehend and perfect every bit of knowledge of who God is and his grace on your life, but that he has already laid hold of that grace on your life. Isn't that good news for you today? All you have to do is run in his grace, not fight for his grace, not earn his grace, run in his grace. And as we run in his grace, we are acknowledging our sin, but we are also forgetting, as the, as the text says. Paul writes this letter as someone who had everything to be guilty about. I mean, it doesn't take much to study the life of Paul, formerly Saul, to know that this man is guilty of a lot. I would dare say that he's more guilty than you. This is someone who has committed murder. Have you committed murder? This is somebody that persecuted the church, was filled with bitterness and hatred, and he caused abuse to the early church. Can that be true of your life? So of everyone who should say, no, you should live with a little bit of guilt. Trust me, I know. He doesn't say that. He says, press on, forgetting what was behind you and reaching forward to what is ahead of you. No matter what you have done, No matter your past, no matter your sin, no matter the shame, God's grace is enough for your life. His unfailing, never-ending, amazing love for you is always enough. Psalms 103, 10 through 12 says, He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Isn't that good news today? That he doesn't look at your life and weigh out and say, ah, this one, this has a little too much sin on his life. I can't forgive him. She she has a really gnarly past. I don't know if I can use her. It's the exact opposite. No matter the weight of your sin, Christ died on a cross, bore the weight of your sin on his shoulders, and on his death on a cross, he said, it is finished. And in that moment, your sin was forgiven. Every sin, past, present, and future, when you acknowledge Jesus as Lord of your life, he forgives you of your sin, and the scripture says he makes you a new creation. That you're not maybe who you used to be. Maybe not even who you ought to be, but you're not who you used to be that you're forgiven and transformed and made made new. As you press on in Christ, you press on in purpose. You see, there's a reason that the rearview mirror is so much smaller than the windshield. The rearview mirror is meant to glance at. It's meant to remind you of where you came from. It's meant to give you a heads up of some potential dangers on your life. How many of you know that 
when you look back, when you, when you glance back at your past, there are some red flags that you may, I don't want to do that again. It's to give you a, a glance of some potential threats in your life. But the windshield, on the other hand, that's where the potential is. That's where the vision is. That's where your future is. The windshield lets you know about your destination. And have you noticed the windshield is this big? The rearview mirror is this big? You could also say that the windshield is your destiny. And I believe that God is calling us to forget about what is behind and to press on, what does the scripture say, towards the upwards call of God on our lives in Christ Jesus. That there's a race to run. We see in verse 14 it says to press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The heaven's agenda call in Christ Jesus. Therefore let us, as many are as mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. You press on towards the goal. Have you ever set a goal that you felt like would be a challenge for you to reach? I love setting goals, and I always love setting goals that I know that are just a little bit further than what I'm capable of doing. I call them faith goals. Well, when you set faith goals or really challenging goals, no matter what you uh, what your profession is and what your hobby is, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes discipline to reach that goal. And it takes this, there's this one word that it takes, and it's not a word that any of us like. It's pain. If you're going to achieve and compete at the highest level, it's going to require pain. I was on a hike this week with my kids, and we were just going to go on a nice stroll in the mountains, and it ended up being a pretty intense hike up about 1,000 feet of elevation with five kids under the age of nine. They are absolute champs. Just, uh, I would say, about a half mile into the hike, uh, my little girl started to get blisters on her feet. And uh, so she took her shoes off, and she hiked this entire, I think it was 2.8 miles, barefoot, up 1,000 feet of elevation. And she is just such a champ. She had the best attitude the whole time. And then I had my other little girl, who was three also. She was just tired past her bedtime. She was hiking. And I remember on this entire hike, I remember telling them all, all along the way, like, guys, press on. I had one just falling out onto the rocks, getting tired. Them, guys, let's press on. Guys, let's press on. We're going to get to the end, and we're going to make it home, and we're going to have a story to tell. But it required a lot of pain. And we, some of my kids whined a lot along the way. But how many of you know that in the pursuit of following a heaven's agenda, it's going to require a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of sacrifice? This isn't something that we should be surprised by. Scripture actually tells us that this is what you're signing up for when you sign up to run the race that God has called us to run. Also, I want us to see that we need to run the right race. There are many races that we can run. This passage speaks of the race of the upper call of Christ in our life. And I also believe that there's another race happening. There's a race of the earthly agenda happening at the same time. Where you're running the race of your dreams, your desires, maybe your passions. What race are you running today? Are you running the right race? You see, the reality is that you may be running hard. You may be disciplined, and you may even be running fast. But if you're running the wrong race, it really doesn't matter. What matters is the trajectory of your life. And the reality is, if we think about a race, what we tend to do with a race is what I did with my kids, where I said, guys, when we get to the top, it's going to be worth it. And then whenever we get home, we'll have a story to tell. And So there's this idea that a race is from point A to point B, or point A to point B and back. But the reality of the race of that of the Christian faith and that as a follower of Jesus is that the race is not a sprint, it's not a hike, it's not a marathon or for you crazies out there, it's not an ultra, it's not an ultra triathlon. The race that God is calling us to is the course of your life. Why? Because the pursuit is in knowing Christ and becoming mature in Him. And I just want to ask, it doesn't matter how long you've been a follower of Jesus, at what point in your life do you say, I've reached the top. I am 
perfected in Christ. I know everything about him. I am fully mature in Christ. That's not the reality of the race that we're called to run. Because maturity is a process, not perfection. It's a pursuit. And it's one that we should be running in with the deepest discipline and longing and passion. I believe we're called to give it all that we have. The good news about running a race as a follower of Jesus is we press on towards the prize from victory, not for victory. From victory. So as we run this race, guess what? We already won. Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? And, And then in 37 he says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him. Philippians 1, 6, a passage we preached about earlier, says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And then one of my favorite verses is found in John 16, 33. It says, in the world you will have many tribulations. I'm going to say it again. In this race that we're called to press on, you are going to have many tribulations, many trials. But take heart, be encouraged, I have overcome the world. That no matter what you're running into, in Christ, you already have victory. You run from victory, not for victory. The crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been applied to your life, those that are followers of Jesus. Therefore, the victory is settled. That we have victory in Christ in this race through his death, burial, and his resurrection. Our sins are forgiven. And we have purpose in our present. And then lastly, let's finish strong. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs to win. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're running after that gold, the one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. Not sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. Let's finish strong the race that God has called us to run. In this season of COVID and a a lot of uncertainty, it's easy for us to pull back, to withdraw, and to isolate. But I want to encourage you right now. Run. Run hard. Train hard. Don't get sloppy. Focus on Christ. Run from victory, and finish strong. Don't slow down in this season. Let's come together. And don't do it alone. How many of you know that on, this, on the hike that I did with my kids, I ended up carrying my little girls a lot of the way. Why? Because their feet hurt. They were tired. One was falling asleep on my back. But how many of you know we don't run the race alone? What does he say? Let us walk. Let us be. Let us walk. Let us be. You are not in this race alone. I know that it feels like you're alone, especially in this season. You're watching from a Zoom or you're watching from your YouTube or television. You feel isolated. You feel alone. You are not alone. We are with you in this. Yeah. And we want to carry you as a team unified together. Unified together as the body. Unified together as the church. We are so much stronger together. We're so much better together. Let us walk. Let us run. And then finally, in verse 17, in closing, he says, Brethren, join in following my example and note that those who so walk as you have us for a pattern, for many walk of whom I have told you, have told you often, and now I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. This is beautiful. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able, even to subdue all things to himself. And the final point is that our future is secure that we're citizens of heaven, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that we are sons and daughters in this race, and that we are pressing towards the mark that we already have the victory.
application for us today is, as we move now into a song of response is, is this. Surrender the past, receive his grace, and run the race. I want to say that again. Surrender the past. Forget the past. Look forward. Press on. Receive his grace. Don't run with guilt and shame over your life. Say, I'm not okay. Not just to us. Say it to God. Let God know in weeping. God, I'm not okay. And then you'll feel his grace over your life. And then finally run the race. If you're watching this and you're hearing me talk as if, you know, you're a follower of Christ, but you're thinking to yourself, you know, I've never really put my faith and trust in Jesus. And you're talking a lot about grace, but I really have never received that grace on my life. I want to encourage you today that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can say yes to receive Christ. Grace is nothing but God's unconditional love, his unmerited favor over your life. It's nothing that you deserve. It's nothing that you can earn. All you can do is receive it by faith. And so I want to invite you now to say yes to Jesus by putting your faith and your trust in him today. Putting your faith and trust in his death, his burial, and his resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. If you want to make that decision to say yes to Jesus, would you pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Jesus, I acknowledge that I need you. I, today, I confess that I've sinned against you. And right now, by faith, I say, Jesus is Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. By your grace, I am saved. And by your power, I am set free. If you prayed that prayer today, then Jesus is Lord of your life. And as the scripture says, you're a new creation in Christ. You can run free in grace, the race that he has called you to run. And we don't want you to run alone. We want to know who you are. So go to our website, pinewood.church. Hit the connect tab. Fill out the connect card. Let us know who you are. We want to come alongside you in your faith journey. And we walk with you, we want to build community around you, and we want to point you to Jesus. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. So thankful for everybody that watched today. God, I pray that we would take this message to heart, that we would forget what was behind, and that we would press on toward the call of Christ on our lives, that we would run from victory and not toward it, and that we would recognize, Father, that we are more than conquerors in you. In this season and in every season, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.